Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Cazorra, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 104. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here on this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. And Dave, we're finally doing a normal podcast. No no one at, at 12.03 a.m. type uh, Steelers news. Still busy, still a lot to talk about, but maybe slow down just a tad as we enter this second week of the new league year. So Dave, how you doing? Good. It uh, certainly has slowed down. I mean, stuff is just barely, barely trickling in uh, now. I guess the big kind of news this morning is uh, kind of a continuation of the Jonah Williams story over there in Cincinnati, how maybe uh, trade conversations are, are, are heating up. So that'll be something to kind of probably pay attention to uh, this next week. And then uh, uh, you got any good shuffleboard stories? <laughs> yeah, what a... <laughs> that's Ben. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to how to deal with that, interpret that. That's all, I guess, water under the bridge. But that was a pretty wild story. Yeah, you trying to envision him in a 49ers uniform last season, too, or no? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, yeah. I, does this all go back to, because that was the whole story of the 49ers came close to trading for him, and I think ownership shot it down back in 2011. No, this is actually more recent, actually. Well, no, no, yeah, I know, but I, I'm saying oh. it's the 49ers' interest. Is it somehow stemmed from that, you know, from a decade ago? I mean, obviously, it's a separate story about how they talked about him trying to come back maybe last year, but what was their, why did they have interest in talking to Ben? Did that stem from some deep-seated interest a decade ago or, or no? I, I just think it was them going through the Rolodex. We need a quarterback, you yeah. know, uh, and, 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 and leave no stone unturned, if you will. I, that That's the way I kind of uh, speculate it probably went down. Okay, and this is all referencing an interview that Ben did with Mark Madden yesterday. So, I mean, it sounds like Ben kind of considered it. He didn't have a quick no. He said he talked about it, kind of preyed upon it, and obviously didn't do it. But it wasn't where he sat there and said, nah, I'm not going to do that. It, it seems like he at least you know gave that some thought. Yeah, at least at least kind of the way the way the context seems to be, uh, or at least what he said. So, uh, uh, yeah, mo- mo- most definitely. Look, I, I, you know, his podcast is, you know, once again, you know, as I've said several times, except for the beer, you know, the beer tasting stuff, which that that isn't my world anymore. I mean, if you were to remove all the you fast forward through the uh, the beer tasting and the food eating portions of the podcast, I I think they've got something good going over there. So, uh, but anyway, uh, on to what's happening Steeler wise, and even though there's really not a lot of you know, it hadn't been much to talk about really since the. Uh, uh, say a Mullo, uh, signing there, uh, there, we, we, we still got a lot to, to discuss today. We do, including one piece of free agency. One of those players who were restricted free agents, not tendered by the Steelers has returned cornerback James Pierre signing a one-year deal with the team. That move became official yesterday. So Pierre, um, you know, had a you know fairly increased role throughout the year and dime packages got to start against Tampa Bay. You know, play was still a bit up and down overall. A guy that to me has always had talent, just trying to find consistency has been his issue. So he's coming back. I don't know if we know terms on the deal. I imagine it's going to be, you know, close to the minimum uh, for him. But do you have any info on the contract beyond that it's one year? No, not yet on that. And it'll probably be a couple of days before some of these, you know, these lower level deals, you know, start uh, start surfacing here. I know the NFL PA public salary cap page report is still several days behind. In fact, there's still like, I think, uh, three players that have yet to hit, even though we have the numbers on them, uh, they haven't hit yet. Uh, and, 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 uh, those, let's see, let me see if I can pull up who is hit, uh, the Peterson contracts hit the Herbig contracts hit the, the Holcomb contract is hit. Ogan Joby is hit and, and, uh, the Roberts contract hit what still has not hit is the Casey 
contract, the Sayamalo contract, and of course the James Pierre contract. But uh, I'm going to venture a guess that it's a one year deal less than what a <laughs> <laughs> what a uh, right of first refusal tender uh, would have been. The question is, is just how low is it? Is it the minimum, which for him I think would be 1.01 million, uh, or is it somewhere a little bit more? I guess less insultful, <laughs> insultful, I guess. Yeah. Like 1.5, yeah. maybe yeah. something like that. I, and, and that's kind of what I envision it being 1.5 or, 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 or lower, you know, within that, because that wouldn't move the, you know, uh, wouldn't move the salary cap needle too terribly much there. So, uh, yeah, probably some anywhere between 1.01 million and 1.5 million. And we'll just have to kind of wait for the details to seep out and, uh, uh, on that. But look, you know, like we said, once they made the decision to not, you know, restricted tender, uh, those group of four players there, you know, there's a good bet that they'd like to get, you know, one, two, one or two of them back at a, at a much cheaper deal, obviously not a great year for restricted free agents. And, you know, I think the free agency class as a whole, even the unrestricted free agents played, played a pretty big role in that overall. So uh, I won't be shocked to see, you know, maybe a guy like JC Hassenauer or something like that uh, also resign after, you know, a week and a half or two weeks is, is, is up in this. And look, you I mean, you still got Terrell Edmonds out there, right? You know, right. And, you know, every, every day that goes by that, that he, he doesn't sign. And you look at the safety market in particular. I mean, just the, the market in general right now, as, as we started the show with, I mean, it, it has really, really trickled down to uh, a crawl down. You see in a lot of these one year deals. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But it is good to have a guy like Pierre back. Uh, you get a good special teams player uh, in him. You get a good uh, backup guy that's got some experience in your defense playing on the outside. Yeah, so right now your your top of your cornerback room looks like Patrick Peterson, Levi Wallace, Akella Witherspoon, James Pierre is kind of more primary outside guys with Arthur Roulette in the slot. And maybe you throw in a, a Trey Norwood who can play there, obviously play safety as well. So still looking at that cornerback room, I would think, and maybe get some speed in there too, really kind of lacking some of that, you know, pure speed, man coverage ability. Uh, with a, a 33 or soon to be 33 year old Patrick Peterson, Levi Wallace, not the best athlete, you know, but let's not going to be that guy. And um, I think Pierre runs better than his 40 time, but you kind of want that maybe high end athletic guy in that room. Aside from Witherspoon, who's obviously extremely inconsistent and totally unreliable. But aside from him, you don't really have that top end athlete in that room. Right, right. And uh, here we are, you know, full weekend of free agency now. And, you know, this team still only has two tackles under contract. <laughs> uh, would you believe that uh, 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 when the tampering period started? Would you believe that here we'd be sitting, you know, a full week into official free agency at this point? And uh, I guess it'd be technically four, four o'clock this afternoon, but uh, that, that, that this team would only have two, two tackles under contract. Well, I mean, I think obviously that, you know, you want to get a veteran in there and maybe that veteran second, third wave type tackle is going to take some time. So, you know, obviously they, there is literally no depth right now. So we'll just kind of let this thing play out and see what the landscape looks like, say, after the draft. I went through the list of late last night uh, after I, after my eyes got tired of, of, of scout hunting at pro days. Uh, you had a good one. Good job on Gorsuch. That was how did you come across Tiffin video? Uh, just in, in, in a Twitter search there, you know, okay. and, Good job. you know, some of these, you, you look at them, you say, ah, I don't, there's not going to be, it's the ones that, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll tell me if I'm right here. It's the ones that sometimes you, you think, ah, they're probably not going to be any footage in there and you click on them and, and that's, that's where you find the Easter oh, egg. hundred percent, 100%. And, yeah. in, in, in there. But, uh, uh, anyway, I, I started to go back through the uh the unrestricted free agent tackles who are still on the market at this point 
and <laughs> it's it's not it's a very unappetizing i mean trent scott is starting to look good right oh right, god that's right, like some 2 right a.m beer goggle situation yeah. we're in right now dave yeah but uh and 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 maybe that's playing a part in this as well too there so uh only two tackles under contract still yeah, I, I've mentioned, you know, the, the names I've talked about before, Cam Irving, Chris Hubbard, not that they're great or even really good options, but they're veteran types. There's versatility. There's uh, familiarity with, with Pittsburgh, with Hubbard, obviously being a former Steeler, Irving, uh, coaching and playing under Pat Myers. So those are the names I've looked towards, but certainly you're not going to find a starter, even somebody to compete, really not going to find that guy in free agency. So if you're going to do something, you're going to turn to the draft and you know, take a tackle with it with pick either probably 17 or 32. And I know everybody's probably, or, or some people listening to this are probably saying, why wouldn't you trade for a Jonah Williams? Well, you probably, you know, technically that, you know, uh, 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 and especially with the Steelers apparently showing some sort of interest in uh, uh, who was the uh, tackle Orlando uh, Brown, yeah, or, Orlando Brown. Uh, may Maybe they are lobbing off a call there, but uh, I think it's important to remember at uh, right now at this point, Jonah, I think, is due something like $12 million in 2023, uh, which is, I think, the final year of his current deal. The fifth and, year option on that, right? Yeah, yeah, fifth yeah. year option on that. So, uh, you know, the student, you know, they would, they would have to do something to free up a little bit of cap space to be able to afford that contract that they took on the full thing. I would think as, you know, if, if, and I, and I don't think they will, but you know, never say never, especially with them showing interest in Orlando Brown jr. If they were to do something to try to trade for a guy like Jonah, uh, a, you would think they'd kind of press the Bengals to take on maybe part of that you know, uh, final year. And then, you know, what kind of compensation would you even give up for that? Would it be a player for a, uh, for a player for a player type thing? And, you know, it just, it, it gets real messy real quick, which, and, 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 and makes you kind of think that maybe the Steelers probably wouldn't be as interested if there, it was truly any interest in, in, in Orlando Brown. Uh, if they were to pursue that, but uh, apparently, according to Ian Rappaport, teams are or interest is heating up there. I kind of envision something make them making a deal. And I don't know, maybe the Bears or the Cardinals or Falcons or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I don't know which team, but I'm pretty confident it won't be the Pittsburgh Steelers if there's enough interest league wide. Which, as you just referenced, the Rappaport tweet seems to indicate there's some interest, and that's just how tackle starved the NFL is. What incentive, what appetite do the Bengals have to trade inside the AFC North? Now, occasionally those deals happen. Sammy Coates to Cleveland, Chris Wormley to Pittsburgh, but those are you know backup Rare. rotational Rare. guy where there isn't there isn't a line of teams showing interest, and you're just trying to get whatever you can get with a starter. You know, caliber. I know Williams struggled last year, had some knee issues, but um, he's still going to be a starter in 2023 for whoever he's mm -hmm. playing for. So the Bengals are not going to trade him to Pittsburgh. Plus, with the you know, the contract, the last year of his deal. And again, I think Pittsburgh wants big, hulking offensive tackles. And Williams is not necessarily the biggest guy. So I just don't see this happening for, for many reasons. I agree. But I, it's just something that people are going to ask about. I know we're listeners to this show. So I figured we might as well address that elephant in the room after ta talking about tackles. Sure. And for whatever it's worth, I believe Ben had said that he believes that the team is comfortable with their tackles in more in a core four. I don't know if that's his own guess or if he's hearing something or some combination of both, but time will tell on that. The Steelers apparently did have interest in in signing another, uh, uh, this time a defensive player that ended up uh, re-signing back with his former team, and that was Andrew Van Ginkle. Uh outside linebacker edge, a good special teams player, uh, a guy that, you know, I think myself and Jonathan Hytrader thought maybe there was a potential that, you know, maybe this team would, 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 would look at him as a depth option out on the edge. But uh, there was a report by uh, Miami beat writer yesterday or day before uh, claiming that uh, Van Ginkle did have an offer or some sort of contact 
uh, or interest uh, in him from the Steelers, but he ultimately re-signed with the Dolphins on a one-year deal that I would imagine is pretty cheap. Yeah, I think the report was interest. I don't know if there was an offer. The report was there were a couple teams in play. The Raiders, Van Ginkle, took a visit to New England, but ultimately decided to return to Miami. I bet the Vic Fangio effect is pretty strong there. Everyone wants to go play for Fangio, who's regarded as one of the best defensive minds in football, the new D.C. in Miami. So certainly looking for that edge step there. Talked about that endlessly, the importance of that. And you know, Pittsburgh felt that. I mean, you know, when they lose TJ Watt and when your pass rush goes from, you know, what you had with TJ Watt, five straight years of 50 plus sacks to goose egg after goose egg until he returns, that's a big wake up call. And everyone obviously knows the importance of TJ Watt. That's not a shock, but you still feel that uh, really, you know, in your face when you actually lose the guy for a long stretch of time and your pass rush does absolutely nothing. So, um, you know, they're probably still going to explore some better op- uh, veteran options. You know, Bud Dupree could be one of those names, but edge depth here is going to be really important. Right. And we'll uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for what happens with uh, Bud Dupree. Definitely. All right, Dave, let's transition to some NFL draft talk. Been a busy week for the Steelers brass and Mike Tomlin, Omar Khan. On Monday, they were at Iowa for the Hawkeyes Pro Day, which surprised me a little bit. And then on Tuesday, staying in Iowa for the Iowa State Pro Day. And today, less surprising, but still notable, uh, they are in Ohio State for the Buckeyes workout for all of their many top prospects. So what do you make of this team in terms of Tomlin Khan being at the Iowa and Iowa State Pro Days? Well, look, uh, we all know, uh, you know, uh, several of the, 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 you know, the, the, the top Iowa prospects there, uh, uh, obviously with, with, with the linebacker and all like that. So, uh, probably less surprising that they were at Iowa and a little more surprising that they were at Iowa state. I would say so. I wonder if it's a partial logistics thing, because I think they're going to be on the road all week this week. And so maybe they didn't want to go from Iowa and then Tuesday, go back home to Pittsburgh and then Wednesday to Ohio state. I mean, maybe that was their calculation. I do obviously with Iowa, we talk about Jack Campbell and we've mentioned his name many times and we'll continue to do so as a, you know, maybe long-term option at inside linebacker. But at Iowa, you have Lucas Van Ness, one of the better edge rushers in this class. And then Iowa state has, Will McDonald, another maybe, you know, potential, maybe looking more likely first round pick uh, as an outside linebacker edge rusher. So is that does that mean anything? The fact that the top prospect at both those pro days were edge guys? Uh, I think there's something there. I mean, I, I, I think we both agree that we expect this team to draft an edge at some point. Uh, you know, Van Ness continues to be one of those difficult prospects to kind of gauge as far as fit goes with the Steelers, I think, because he is a little bit uh, uh, bigger, uh, at least from a weight aspect uh, kind of player. And, you know, you kind of look back at, 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 you know, last year uh, and, 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 you know, what they got in the Texas A&M kid, man, I'm having problems recalling names this morning. All of a sudden, uh, with DeMarvin Leal. Yeah. DeMarvin Leal, Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of fuzzy. I need another monster drink this morning here. Uh, you know, it it, kind of the same feel, you know, is, 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 is Van Ness a guy that maybe you can bulk up? Is he a guy that you think could, could, you know, lose a little weight. Is he fine at his weight? Can he, can he give you everything you need? Is just a a, a, a traditional Steelers outside linebacker at, at you know at his current weight? And then look, you know, they like going where there where there are numerous prospects to look at as well too. So that probably played a, a role in it. On top of it, and you know, they do even Iowa has a couple of what a uh, couple of safeties too, right? In in in, in Moss and Kavion Merriweather, I think is the other kid over there. Yeah, Moss has been mostly a corner. Maybe some people have talked about him trying to push to safety, but I think he can stick a corner than Merriweather as their safety. So, yeah, I mean, the, the two requirements for Tomlin and Khan or the GM, you know, in past years, Colbert, to go to a pro day typically have been, as you mentioned, you know, several, you know, draftable, pretty high end prospects and then at least one guy that's like a first round slam dunk type. And with Iowa, that is Van Ness. Campbell's really not gotten steam at, at 17 and going that early could be a guy at 32. That makes a lot more sense. So that's kind of what's on my radar right now. And then certainly at Iowa State, 
Um, there's really just two guys there with McDonald, who's going to be a potential first round pick, and then the receiver. But we should talk about some as well, like Xavier Hutchinson, who might be a you know second, probably more third round uh, pick as a potential big slot. And so that one surprised me, but I don't know if that was just, we're in the area, let's just go to the pro day because you know, we were just in Iowa yesterday. You know, I think there's a dark horse in in that group that they went and saw at Iowa State because, you know, obviously after uh, early morning being spotted there, you start you start rolling through the prospects again. And, you know, if, when you get a moment, you kind of peek over at some tape on several of these guys. And I I had already watched a little bit of Hutchinson, went back and watched a little bit more of him. But as the day went on, uh, the, you know, we, we got the report and really more confirmation that Terrell Austin uh, put uh, uh, Iowa State defensive back Anthony Johnson through his drills there. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. We uh, we didn't see, uh, you know, uh, anybody, you know, position coach from it doesn't mean that they weren't there, but I don't think that we spotted anybody really other than 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 Austin, uh, Tomlin and Khan, uh, other than, you know, Dan Rooney Jr., I think. And who was the other scout there? Uh, Maybe Kelvin Fisher. I never. Yeah. Officially saw eyes on him, but yeah, I don't believe I'll have to go back and check, but I don't, I don't recall an actual positional coach being there. Now, obviously Austin is your defensive coordinator, but it, it would make sense with his background at all to put Anthony Johnson uh, through his paces. He is a very, uh, you know, obviously you're going to go where, 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 where the prospects are, you know, and I, I don't want to say they use it as a cover or anything like that, but I, I think there's more to to Anthony Johnson maybe and and the Steelers' interest in him than maybe meets the eye. There, you have got a guy that uh, uh, was a cornerback at I at, at Iowa State. You know, five what five seasons there made the move from corner to safety last year and really did a good job in making that move overall. And I, I really found, and I wrote about this last night be, and, and only because of his uh, post pro day interview and some of the questions he was asked uh, there. And he was asked kind of specifically, how, you know, if the Steelers told him how they envision him fitting into their defense. And he says, I think they're going to play me at safety and nickel just as a versatility piece to be able to play high and roll down without switching your defense. And uh, he, he went on to say he prides himself into uh, being able to play any position in the back end. And then you kind of go look a little bit of his, at his tape and you, you hearken back to the, uh, to the uh, combine and look at his numbers and his RAS score this guy fits everything <laughs> and you look at kind of interviews that he's done and how he carries himself to me. I came away after writing this, this post last night about him as a guy that I think they're going to have serious interest in. And, and I really think maybe of, of all the prospects that were at uh, Iowa state uh, yesterday, I envision him of all of them having the highest likelihood of being drafted by the Steelers. Okay. I like it. That That's a really good call by you. And you're right. I mean, this team, you know, talk about needs slot corner right now. What, what is there? We just kind of mentioned that earlier. Millett as a rundown guy, but not a coverage guy. And Trey Norwood really don't know what he's going to offer you in year three. No guarantee he even makes the team. So if they're, you know, Johnson's talking about, they're looking at safety slot corner, which again is what Norwood has been you know, tried at, then, then this makes a lot of sense because there really is nothing there right now. And I doubt Anything of significance will get added in free agency uh, before the draft rolls around. So that's a, a really good call by you. What, is, what are some of the athletic numbers on Anthony Johnson? I'm not too familiar with uh, some of the, the, the numbers he put up. Uh, four, five, four, 40. Uh, a vertical, boy, explosion. You want to talk about explosion? 37 and a half inch vertical, uh, 10 foot, five inch broad jump. Uh, and I don't know if we, I don't know if he did the, I would imagine, I don't know if we have the three cone or the short shuttle on him from yesterday. I forgot to go back and try to pull out. I would imagine he would have died. He didn't do those at the combine. So I would think that, uh, he did those, uh, at, at his pro day yesterday. 
Okay, yeah, I don't have the testing in front of me, so I'm not 100% sure. And just one thing of note, it is a little confusing. There are two Anthony Johnsons right. in this class, the Virginia corner, and then there's the Iowa State guy that you're referring to. Right, right. I'm trying to pull up, uh, see if I can find real quick what their, I don't know if their numbers have been released yet. Uh, yeah, some schools are good about that. Some schools right. don't really seem to release that. So I, I don't know for sure. I'm just looking at some of his career stats. Five force fumbles. That's going to be attractive mm-hmm. and uh, made some plays in the backfield. So, yeah, that, that's a that's a really good pull by you. I it just and he's he, you know, he's built. He's built like that uh, kind of strong safety, kind of that uh, slot kind of player as well too and obviously in 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 uh has a lot of experience there uh in over five seasons and even though he was there all that time you know you immediately go look at his age and all like that he's not going to turn he's born in 99 like december of 99 so he won't be, he won't be 33 until uh later, later portions of the 2023 season so uh, and he seems to be a really, really high character guy. So once again, you know, you go in, you, you go into yesterday and then we find out that, that, you know, they're at, at, at the Iowa state pro day. And then, you know, you got the big names and obviously Will McDonald and Xavier Hutchinson and, and both those are talented kids, but, you know, as the day progressed and especially, you know, the thing that triggered me was, was Austin putting, putting him through his, uh, uh, through his, through his workout and all. And sure, that, that's that, huge. And that caused me to dig deeper into them. And luckily, uh, uh, Iowa State put all the uh, pro day inter- uh, post pro day interviews up on uh, up on the uh, web uh, up on their website. I had an opportunity to go through all those. So uh, I wouldn't have, you know, it, that's why you try to pay attention to this stuff as, as day by day and go through them and all. I I honestly came away with thinking, man, do I want to write about this? Because people are going to start jumping on this kid. <laughs> and, and, but, and here's the other thing, you know, the Steers obviously right now don't have a fifth or sixth round pick, right? right. Uh, where, where does this kid even slot, you know, uh, in, in, in draft value? Cause this, uh, uh, I, I, I think the only all-star game that he made it to was the, uh, NFL PA ball. Mm. Uh, okay. And I and I think maybe that has a lot to do with him switching positions and yada yada. You know, look, some of these kids just fall through the cracks, right? Sure, it happens sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I was going to ask you about if you had a gauge on the round. I don't. Well, is it so? He, I, it feels it's fourth or seventh he, right now is kind of where you're at. And, and it feels like he's a uh, he's a fifth to sixth rounder. Is 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 in the limited amount of tape that I've watched on. That's what he feels like. Yeah, but if they like him, and let's say he's considered a fifth round guy, then you would say probably a fourth, the fourth round pick. Yeah. Okay. Could, could you see this team drafting a future strong safety slash nickel option that they really like in the fourth round? Yeah, I could do. I could see that. I mean, Norwood, not that that was the intent at the moment, but was a seventh round pick and got on the field pretty quickly as a rookie because of the versatility and football IQ that he had. And and, I'm, and Johnson's a different kind of body type, probably a little different style overall, more physical. Um, but yeah, I could see that because right now, a there's a need of strong safety. Not to, I'm not that I'm saying Johnson's going to start, but there's still currently a need there, and certainly at slot corner, there's there's something that has to be addressed as well. All right, now let's go back. Uh, I just wanted to put it out there that 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 I came away thinking that of all three, you know, these three three guys, Will McDonald and Xavier Hutchinson, uh, by the end of the day, I, I really you know saw Anthony Johnson as as a really likely pick, and that's not a take. You know, it's not uh, any kind of diss at, at, at Hutchinson, uh, or, or, or Will McDonald. What are your thoughts on Will McDonald? Freaky athlete. I mean, just an unbelievable guy. Um, he grew up playing everything from baseball to, I think he was a surfer. I mean, he's just, you know, crazy backstory there, martial arts and had the video of him jumping over the car, super bendy, super athletic, you know, tall, lanky, kind of a wiry guy had some really good battles with Darnell Wright. At the Senior Bowl, you can bet Pittsburgh was paying close attention given their interest in in Wright and at the position in general. So, um, you know, tested unbelievably well. I think his streak on time was excellent for his frame. Um, I do like his tape. The production's there, tied for the all-time sack leader in the in the Big uh, Big Twelve. So, you know, really good prospect overall. Uh, and as far as Hutchinson goes, uh, was able to watch his uh, 
post pro day interview as well. He very, very likable kid. Very, very likable. And I went and looked at the old uh, Alex Kazora, and I know mm. you're going to be updating them fairly soon here, uh, what the Steelers look for as far as the measurables go. Uh, and at least from the uh, uh, compilation that you had last year at the wide receiver position, obviously you still have to factor in uh, uh, Austin into that for, 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 for this year's set. I think he checked like eight of the boxes there. And I think he just missed on a couple of them. Okay. Yeah. It seems like he's profiled as somebody that can play inside out, maybe be that, that big slot type. And so I, I need to know and learn more about Hutchinson, but you know, that's a guy that, that Tomlin also seemed to be watching uh, fairly closely. Okay. So yeah, busy day. And then Iowa, it's Campbell, Van Ness, Riley Moss that you mentioned. So um, all names to keep an eye on. And today, of course, they're at Ohio State. And so we're talking day one Jones. You could even throw in the center, Luke Weipler, although I think that's less likely given the interior tension Pittsburgh has paid to free agency. There is um, Zach Harrison, who's kind of a long tweener-ish type, but kind of interesting guy with some power. Who else is at Ohio State right now to watch out for? Obviously, you got CJ Stroud throwing, Jackson Smith and Jigba, uh, the receiver, you know, maybe, maybe the first receiver off the board. Um, hopefully, see him fully healthy and working out today. So, as always, a, a pretty you know long list of names at Ohio State, according to Jim Nagy, director of the Senior Bowl. There are five members of Pittsburgh there, and so we know it's Tomlin, we know it's Khan. Imagine maybe Austin's making the trip with him. Um, you know, maybe Dan Rooney Jr. probably going there and, and somebody else. So we'll try to see who else is there besides Tomlin and Khan. Yeah, uh, Mike Tomlin is not shy. I, we'll, we'll have pictures of him <laughs> by, by, <laughs> yes. by the end of the day, uh, shaking hands and kissing, kissing babies. Yeah, nobody. Uh, what's the, the phrase? Glad handing. Is that the, the phrase for it? Nobody does that better than Mike Tomlin. I mean that in a, in a positive way because he just connects and just has that personality so certainly works in his favor all right uh what else have we found on the pro day circuit usc had their pro day yesterday it was a pretty wet and rainy one and a pretty heavy california downpour pittsburgh sending mark sadowski the director of player scouting there and so obviously you know the biggest name there is wide receiver jordan addison but i think of other note there's the edge rusher whose name we're both struggling to currently pronounce, but uh, that guy's coming in for a pre chat visit. What is it? Tuli. Tuli Apolo Lodo. Lodo. I'll let you. I'm, I'm, I'm letting yeah. you be the sacrificial lamb here on the, on the pronunciation. So appreciate that. You're always, welcome. Always thinking about me. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of a big edge with some, some great power. That's a little bit of that awkward body type and fit, but um, a guy that Pittsburgh obviously has interest in. Yeah, I think he's more of a later round guy, right? Yeah, I don't know exactly where he's at. You know, he's not a first round pick, not a second. Well, it's probably like maybe third round. I mean, maybe if you have you know, 49 at the ceiling, 49 to 80, maybe if I had to guess and engage where he's at, uh, I don't know for sure. But again, it kind of goes back to, is he kind of like Leal, where it seems a little redundant to have this guy and Leal, unless you're committing full time to right. Leal being a down defensive lineman. You know, Omar Khan suggested that they're not necessarily doing that. Right. But uh, he he did say that uh, I think it's one of two teams uh, that he's got a currently has a pre-draft visit. We're we're slowly starting to build a pretty nice list of guys, uh, uh, at least as far as March goes, you know, uh, a nice list of guys that are coming in. We're at six right now, and it used to be pre-COVID, the teams, at least Pittsburgh, would announce that when guys came in, which made our job very easy. And I don't know if they're doing that as much, or if they're going to return to that, um, hopefully. So we're, we're at six right now, and hopefully we can, I don't know, at least get to 15 or so by the time the draft rolls around. One other name to, to look for is Makai Blackman, their cornerback, who's a strong man cover corner that could play inside um, that I think you know would, would be of intrigue to Pittsburgh. Okay. And then Andrew Voorhees says he has surgery officially on his ACL next week. And so that ACL taking some time, I guess, for the swelling to go down and his actual rehab and recovery to start. So that's the book on Voorhees. Okay. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. That's probably basically it from the pro day and kind of uh, scouting side of things. So actually one more, one more thing I forgot to mention on, I believe Monday it was at Bowling Green, another great uh, Eagle Eye by you, Dave Bryan. 
Uh, Carl Dunbar going to Bowling Green to work out Carl Brooks. So it was Carl coaching Carl. And uh, that's, that's certainly something to note. Yeah, absolutely. There is, especially if you miss out on maybe a guy uh, like Dexter or Brzee or something like that. That's that's someone that you could look at probably, I don't know what, third, third, fourth round right around in there. Yeah, I think third round, maybe fourth round sounds really good for him. He was one of the biggest combine snubs. He was at the Senior Bowl, one of a few guys who went to the Senior Bowl that did not get a combine invite. Been watching his tape a lot. There'll be a profile tomorrow on Steel's Depot on him. Really high energy, twitchy guy, good first step, uh, played up and down the line, played even stand up outside linebacker, occasionally dropped in the coverage as a big defense alignment. Um, you know, dominated the math, just some stupid good games. You watch the Toledo game. I mean, he's just in the backfield the entire time. Try to watch him against some more upper tier competition. UCLA, I was hoping to see him against John Gaines a bit, but he was kind of playing over tackle more. So I didn't really get to watch those matchups too much. Uh, Tennessee game last year, quieter then, but overall a really athletic, twitchy guy that, that doesn't have great lengths and maybe doesn't have a tremendous anchor uh, in terms of run defense, but that quick first step, great hand use, always stays clean, loves that cross chop, inside spin, uh, a really toolsy, fun guy to watch on tape. What did he uh, pull up his uh, combine? Uh, he was not a combine invite, so he didn't oh, get okay. pro day. That's yeah. Right. Uh, he was a really surprising snub. I thought that was the guy that I think everybody was sitting there going, How does Carl Brooks, who's got great production too, not get a, a combine invite? Was which which all star game was he? Let me pull up the Senior Bowl. He senior was at the Senior Bowl. Bowl. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um the measurements, I think the length is thirty two and a half or something around there. So it's not ideal, but of course Brzee doesn't have great length. Dexter doesn't have great length, and so it's not unique to Carl Brooks. All right. All right. So that's the note on that. And generally the rule of thumb in the past has been first round Tomlin GM. That's what you want to look for. Second, third round positional coaches is kind of what you want to look for. So that's the way that I've always kind of divvied this up. I know it is partially a, a new regime with Khan and, and uh, Andy Weidel, but uh, I imagine those rules are still going to hold pretty true until proven otherwise. Are you surprised you haven't spotted more position coaches yet? Yeah, it's always I felt like this happened last year, too, where I didn't see a ton of them. And there's still a couple there's, this week's going to be busy with pro days. And you may see someone at Ohio State and Penn State and, and that kind of thing. So I thought maybe I would see some more. But, you know, we'll keep our eyes peeled. What do you think has been the most significant position coach sighting so far? Yeah, I mean, there's only been a handful to choose from. I, you know, I don't think Scaronzi is going to be the guy in the first round, so I don't think that one is super significant. I mean, you have what? What else do you have? You have Dunbar for Brooks. You have Curry for Dorian Williams. Uh, That's you, pretty uh, significant, I think, potentially. Sure. Yeah, I think you know, new coach comes in and kind of gets some new guys. Obviously, has some new players there in free agency. So, yeah, I would probably say, yeah, maybe Curry for Dorian Williams. And and how would you rate, you know, how, how Austin uh, putting Johnson through the paces at Iowa State, like we just mentioned, even though technically he's the D.C.? Yeah, I think it's still pretty notable because, as you mentioned, he's a defensive backs coach. That's his background. And so I was kind of going through old clips, and Austin has done this over the years. So I, I, it's not a positional coach, but I kind of treat it the same. Anytime a coach is putting a guy through a workout, D.C. or whatever, I don't care what the, the title is. To me, that speaks of like interest. Okay, this coach was really trying to make sure that he was the guy putting the guy through the drill. And if they're going to go to all that trouble, that means I like the guy. Okay. All right. Sticking with the draft here, Dave, my version 2.0, my Pittsburgh Steelers mock draft drop yesterday. And everybody loved it. And that's the end of the story. Everybody said great job. And they they carried me around on their shoulders. And that's (laughs) exactly what happened. Now, uh, not really the case there. Now, the second, the first mock draft I did a couple of weeks ago was kind of a bit more of like what I think makes sense as opposed to what I think the team will do, given that we were pre free agency and really pre pro days and, and all those kinds of things. So it's really kind of a more muddy projection. I think by this one, things start to crystallize a little bit more. And so I'll roll through my selections here. 17th overall, a bit of, of a surprise, but I, I think this one makes sense. I went day one Jones, the big tackle from Ohio State. They don't get any bigger than day one Jones and Pittsburgh's trend of bringing in big people. Their uh, interest in Orlando Brown Jr. Obviously, they have interest in Jones. He's got a, a top 30 visit coming up here um, at some point, probably next month. And so 
I know that seems a little high, but if you like a guy, you like a guy and go ahead and take him at 17. Yeah, I just uh, uh, yeah, I wonder about how you know, where his stock is. Yeah, I think 32, you know, it probably is a little more conventional to say him at 32. But if you're the Steelers, do you want to wait for that that tackle to hopefully fall to you at 32 and just hope that that guy gets there? And he may not. And so I, I know that probably feels a bit high, but you know, given how how much this team has ignored the position early for the last decade, I think you don't want to wait and, and see what happens. And as we recap the other night on the live stream, this this team has history in liking those hulking big guys. You know, Max Starks was one of them, obviously. And, you know, Alejandro Villanueva was 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 was, was obviously a big guy. And uh, Banner, Mike Adams, even though he didn't right. work out, but there's a big Ohio State tackle. Same kind of thing. But I think Jones is a much better athlete. Uh, playing along the, uh, the the same lines uh, 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 of a tackle there in uh, George's Broderick Jones, how much would this is something that jumped out to me when 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 looking at games played and starts and all like that? How how much significance do you think they place on when you go back and look at the tackles that the students have drafted over the last I don't know what uh, six seven years or something like that? Uh, how much emphasis do you put on? Uh, games played, games started. I hadn't done a lot of research to it. I'm sure there's an element to it that they like that production, that body of work. But I think with Jones, I know he doesn't have a large body of work, but just given the competition, they love the SEC guys. That's, of course, where Dan Moore came from. He had played more football in college than Jones had. But I think if there's, I think it gets, if you're, if you're, if you're not playing a lot of games, you, you better be playing in a top level conference. I think it's Pittsburgh's mentality. So I don't think it would, prevent Pittsburgh from drafting Broderick Jones just because he's not been a three-year starter. Okay. It's Is just, that your feel or just, do you feel? It, it just it's something that stuck out to me that I think uh, that I just did a kind of initial search on uh, the tackles that they have picked over, like I said, the last, you know, what, six, seven, eight seasons and all. And um, most of those, those guys, I think, uh, tend to be up in the 40 or more games played category. Okay. Do we know who had the least amount of starts of a tackle that they selected? Do you have like specific numbers on the range, maybe of starts that they've, of guys uh, they drafted? I, I did, but then I had to reboot and I didn't save the file. Okay. But I think generally you're right. I mean, you know, more, like I said, was a, you know, basically what three, three and a half year starter. What was like a Marcus Gilbert? How much did he play at Florida? I'm just trying to think about names because they don't draft. They have not drafted a ton of tackles, especially early. Right. Uh, um, let's see. How many games did uh, Gilbert play at Florida? I mean, even in, like in the top two rounds is you know, how many tackles did they draft Gilbert. I mean, they never drafted a first round tackle under Kevin Colbert. So the, the top end guys, that sample size is light. I don't think I went back as far as uh, okay. Gilbert. What, what what tackles were part of that group? Like Beecham or not even that far back? Not, I guess. not, e- not even that That's far That's farther back. back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was like Moore and who else? Oh, Lord. Uh, let me see here if I can recall. Like a Duran Gray count? As, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, you know, like he, that. he was okay. in there. Uh, if, uh, let me pull up the list real quick. Okay. Yeah, Pittsburgh is never... You know, the, the, the sample size was maybe a bit lighter a tackle uh, than it was. And they got some diamonds in the rough and Matt Filer and a Villanueva. Gilbert was one of them. Second round guy that transformed his body and you know, got healthy, stayed healthy. All right. Uh, obviously, we have the most recent being uh, Dan Moore, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Then we have you have to go. I think I was looking at offensive linemen in total, in, in totality. Uh, okay. so, so that would have been uh, Dan Moore, Kendrick Green, uh, Kevin Dodson, who obviously played a ton of games uh, at Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, it was Derwin Gray who had his fair share. Uh, Chiquama Corfor obviously played quite a bit at uh, Western Michigan. Oh, where did I leave off at here? I, I think that might have been as far as I had got down the list uh, there because then you'd have to go back, I think, 
to oh no Wesley Johnson uh, I, I made it that back, back that far uh, obviously he played a lot at Vanderbilt but mm-hmm. that I remember that being the cutoff now okay gotcha so it's interesting question Mike, for sure Mike Adams in 2012 I didn't look but I know he played quite a bit at at, at, at Ohio State right 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 so yeah interesting thought Calvin there for Beecham sure. at SMU was another one then you get into the Marcus Gilbert the Keith Williams at Nebraska. Yeah, I didn't go back that far to, to gotcha. search at the games. All right. Well, with my second round pick here, going cornerback in Keeley Ringo, another a reported top 30 visitor. And again, they're looking for some size, that speed combination. I understand there's a big debate about Ringo's tape and could he move to safety? And you see some of the tightness. And I look at some of the three cone times that he did at his pro day. And those numbers are certainly concerning. They reinforce the idea. He's kind of a, a, a stiffer in a line guy. So, would I make the pick of Ringo? Probably not, but I could certainly see this team going back to Georgia in the second round for the second straight year. Okay, that's that's uh, reasonable. Uh, other second round pick here at 49, going back to the uh, the classics here with Keanu Benton, defensive lineman from Wisconsin to play right there in the middle. He can play up and down the line, but you know, kind of a starter at nose tackle and have a starting defensive line of Okunjobi, Benton, and Hayward, and obviously maybe still more work to do there in terms of depth, but uh, the size, the length, the quickness, uh, the, the hand use, the wrestler background, the toughness, Wisconsin type. I mean, he just checks all those boxes. They're going to be at that pro day tomorrow, aren't they? Wisconsin's- Is there anything competing tomorrow? I was trying to look at the schedule. I can't remember. There's nothing. There's, there's Penn, when is Penn State's? Is that tomorrow or is that Friday? Uh, let's, let me roll through these real quick. Let me go okay. back to the top here. Of the Everything runs together pro day related for me at this point. I'm just lost in a sea of hunting through clips. And- let's see. Tomorrow you have uh, on Thursday, Cincinnati, Houston, uh, Wisconsin, NIU, Cal, Cal uh, Utah, Alabama. Uh oh. Oh, they're going to be at Bama, so they're not going to Wisconsin. Uh, if they do go to Wisconsin, then it's really notable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The uh, in fact, the Alabama one's going to be broadcast on one of them, SEC Network or something like that. I don't think the Wisconsin one is. So that might be a little telling if they go to uh, Wisconsin and not Alabama. Yeah, but they're probably going to go to Alabama. Mm-hmm. But Benton's not a first-round pick, so the Tomlin Con is not needed for him to be somebody mocked. Now, does a Dunbar go there? Right. That would be cool, or Denzel Martin. I should mention the coaching changes as well. We will do that here briefly. But, uh, yeah, I, I suspect it's going to be Tomlin Con at Bama Thursday and then probably Penn State on Friday. Okay. All right. Third round pick here, going safety. You know, I know that Terrell Edmonds could return and the landscape here could shift, but you know, if it's not Edmonds, I don't know who, who, who plan B is for the Pittsburgh Steelers. The free agent class looks pretty weak right now. And the draft class certainly looks weak. So I went Jordan battle kind of the best safety I could find in that third round range. And he's the guy with size and the pedigree, obviously um, he's got some good tape, just so inconsistent has to trust his, his instincts more, but somebody that has the size to play that strong safety role. I think the probably the biggest pushback you got from, from that is people saying he won't be there. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's how these things go. I thought third round was pretty reasonable. I mean, heck, the first safety may not be even taken in the top 31 picks in the first round. So, um, you know, I think I looked up a uh, mock draft database, which is kind of the rough guy that I use. And that seemed to be roughly where he's being projected. So it might be a, a tick low, but I don't think it's unreasonable to, to project that. Well, uh, do you have uh, that that database pulled up real quick, where you can search for Anthony Johnson out of Iowa State? Who we just yeah, they about? had him as an undrafted guy, but the the sample size was super light. Like there really weren't a lot of mock drafts they had included. There was one I think okay. that had him as a seventh round pick. So I, I probably wouldn't trust that right now. Okay, All right. And you said battle is where? I can check. I forget exactly where they had him. I can pull up his profile right now. Their projection, and again, that's just their collection of mock drafts, and it's not an exact science, but they have third round 76 overall. Is okay. where he's, that's just an aggregate of mock drafts. Doesn't you know, mean everything or, or much, but that's just kind of the guide I use to make sure I'm being semi-realistic, and I think that that fits. Okay. All right, fourth round here, going back to mentioned this early about Aaron Curry, Dorian Williams, and so going the inside linebacker from Tulane in the fourth round, 120 overall, of course, for that 
uh, Curry connection. And maybe this team says that, okay, if we can't get a Jack Campbell, we'll wait on the position a bit to address other areas of need where guys have to start and play right away, uh, potentially like corner, like safety, like defensive line, like offensive tackle. So I think Williams in the fourth round is a, a perfect fit. Yeah, and he obviously on the radar for the obvious reasons with Curry there. Right. Seventh round. So making that jump from round four to round seven. It's a long the, wait. What'd you do in is. between there? <laughs> trying to sell Kevin Dawson for that fifth round pick. You're, you're promising yeah. me there. Uh, round seven here. Going with the edge. That edge Mac rusher. Just the perfect Pittsburgh thing. Thomas and Coom. And that's a guy that has size. 262 pounds production. A Mac pass rusher. That is Pittsburgh's thing to do. And I know that Andy Weidel's not making the picks here, but in Philadelphia, the Eagles were always taking dart throws on late round pass rushers. Every single year they were doing that. And so I think there's a good chance they do that again this year. Uh, I haven't watched him yet. What's uh, how much of him have you watched? He was at the senior bowl. I'd watched him a little bit prior to then had a big fumble recovery touchdown against, I forget who it was Akron or something, but he's got, you know, he's six two two sixty two, So he's got size. He's got production last year, 11 and a half sacks. Um, you know, I think he's still a pretty good athlete for that size, that frame seventh round, I think is pretty solid. Who is, uh, the other edge? Were there any other edges you were considering about that spot? Yeah, there's a handful and maybe I'm a little too low on Jose Ramirez. I think he had a good, you know, pro day and combine workout. He may not last this long, but Lonnie Phelps from Kansas. I've thought about for a while too. Uh, was there anybody else? Somebody others considered, I don't see any names there, but it's kind of been, you know, one of those edge types in Coombe, Lonnie Phelps, some, someone like that. Okay. And finally, with the last pick of my mock, two you're convinced you're convinced they're going to take a quarterback, aren't you? Um, I'm getting closer to that, and it makes me sadder by the day. And so I'm putting a quarterback here. Uh, again, this is what I think they will do, not what I would do, but Dorian Thompson Robinson, the quarterback from UCLA. And I think at least this year, Assuming no other quarterback gets brought in prior to the draft, it makes more sense because he would be, as of right now, the true number three quarterback. He would actually get reps. What a concept. He would actually get a chance to practice and get an opportunity to show uh, why he was a draft pick. And so whether it's him, Max Duggan, I could certainly see that um, being the plan, especially, again, if Pittsburgh does not change their business model of how they how they pay out undrafted guys, if they don't give partial base salary guarantees and just signing bonuses you are not going to sign one of the top quarterbacks. They always get you know good money in terms of a partial base salary guarantee. So the way that you uh, get around that is by drafting a guy in the seventh round. So I believe that that's going to be the strategy. How much do you think uh, will come into play if they do draft a quarterback late uh, uh, again this year? The whole accuracy, accuracy uh, talk. In terms of them prioritizing a quarterback who's accurate, is that right. what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, that's always something that's what Kevin Colbert talked about. Right. Um, I don't know. If, was was Oladokun considered a hyper-accurate quarterback? So I think it was fine. I don't know if he was like considered this super pinpoint type passer, but I think they want somebody with some mobility. Oladokun had that last year. They can kind of you know have that decent fit in the offense with their boots and sprint outs and just guys who can create, and uh, Robinson has you know some of that. Okay. So that is the mock draft and, you know, things that we're missing here, tight end, you know, there's a gentry return to Eagle sign another blocker type. That's pretty easy to do in free agency uh, slot corner. You know, who's going to be that guy still not really super addressed here in this mock, but only so many picks to work with. Right. All I, right I, li- I like it overall. I mean, it, it, it's, it's definitely like, like you said, you know, you get further into this thing and you get a l- couple of pieces of the puzzle of where they go into pro days and, and kind of what has happened in, 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 in free agency so far. And then that, that, you know, you, you put all that stuff together and that helps kind of form, uh, you know, at least this part of the off season of, of, of where your mocks are at. Right. Now, the biggest question is, when is Dave Bryan's first mock draft happening? I know you're itching to do one. Oh, uh, yeah, it's coming. I don't know exactly <laughs> when, but I've, I've started right. uh, I've started to think about putting one together. I'm only going to probably do about, you know, I think I did two last year okay. and I usually end up uh, uh, my, my first one. I end up usually wishing in, you know, was my last one, because as of late, my first one seemed to be a lot more uh, closer or at least having a pick or two in there, uh, then, then, then my final one. Yeah. So you got to do your first one last, I guess is the way you have to, I wish to I tell could, yourself. I wish I could get my mind to actually do that. 
you know, but <laughs> uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, An- uh, Anthony uh-huh. Johnson's going to be in my first one. <laughs> Just where at, I wonder, is where you're going to put yeah, it. That was kind of yeah. my thought. Uh, that'll be the question. Yeah, have you had any any teasers on kind of where your head is at first round? Or are you still just kind of really just brainstorming how you want this thing to, to well, look? Well, there, there's the whole bias thing in my head as well, too. And, and there's a bias aspect of cornerback in the first round that I, that I, I struggle with because of my own personal wants and views of the position when it comes to the draft. Okay, fair enough. Um, when is the Illinois? No, the Illinois, Illinois Pro Day already happened, huh? I was trying to think about Devon Witherspoon. Does he fall a bit with the injury that he's had? Although Witherspoon has a private workout, I believe, next month. I doubt Tomlin and Khan would go to that, but I just wonder if that becomes maybe a wrinkle to the first round rule for a guy that, that's hurt, but probably not. But I've just well, kind of thought about Witherspoon falling a bit. You know, it, yeah. Uh... Day one, you know, you having day one Jones uh, uh, in there and all like that. You know, I w- the more I watch on, the more I, I go back through his tape, the more I like him. I, I was I kind of viewed him more as a, a slam dunk second round guy uh, initially. But, you know, knowing the Steelers and, you know, I definitely the need. And here we are once again, a uh, full week into free agency and they only have two tackles. Uh, uh, under contract. And when you, you see the physical, you know, the look of, of, of them wanting to be much more physical on that line potentially. And uh, I guess the, one of the things that that's all that would be a deterrent is, man, is this guy really truly only a right tackle? And, 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 you know, it goes back to, and, and look uh, right at Tennessee too, is another one that I'm struggling with because I like him. I like him as a player, uh, but I, I, I kind of wonder what it would look like if they did draft a guy that they fully intended on coming in initially to be a right tackle. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your thoughts are. You know, could Jones, does he have the feet that the tool set to play left tackle? I, maybe, I think it's the question, but it seems like if you were to draft him, you're going to keep him at right tackle. That's my feel as well, too. And that's part of the reason I kind of struggle with some of these tackles that the Steelers could potentially draft in the first round is mm-hmm. they, they seem like their fits more on the right tackle spot. Right. And I made mention of that in my my mock draft. And so th- that does create kind of an awkward and a little messy of a situation, because how do you plan that out for training camp? I think we talked about this a bit that you don't want to hand, you know, day one Jones the job, but. The way that I would do it is, you know, Jones, first day training camp, how would the reps look? Jones at right tackle, first team, a core four left tackle, first team, more immediately starts working on the swing role. And if Jones can't win the job, then a core four shifts back to right tackle, more back to left tackle. I know that's not necessarily an ideal way to do it, but I think it's the best way to do it if you were to, you know, explore the hypothetical of drafting a day one Jones. Look, if, if, if you know, don't bypass a talented kid. Yeah, and that's my argument that I know it'd be a little messy to say how do all the pieces fit, but if Jones is the right guy, then the short term pain of trying to figure out some training camp reps and how this thing looks to start is going to be quickly forgotten about if Jones is the best guy a year or two, three, five years from now. So I think it's still you can still justify it, although it does create some messiness at the top and trying to juggle all the reps and you're kind of bouncing some guys back and forth. And where does Paris Johnson fit in all this? I think gone before 17. I think if he does fall, then he should, she should definitely be in that conversation. I think he'd be maybe the favorite if he were to get the 17. I just don't think the top tackle in this class is going to get this to pick 17. Okay. Even in a quarterback heavy class. I mean, four guys are going to go 13 more picks left or whatever it is. 12 more picks left. I got to think Paris Johnson's gone before then. Oh, uh, look, I, I, you know, where, where I'm at right now, especially from, from where they have gone, uh, so far and need and all like that, you know, I, I think you really got to consider obviously Joey Porter jr. If he's on the board, uh, at 17 is potentially being their guy, uh, uh, put potentially a tackle, so, you know, such as uh day one Jones or, 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 or right at Tennessee. I think that that's in, in the equation there. Uh, I think Jack Campbell, you know, potentially, could could be in the mix there at this point at uh, 17. Yeah, I really, okay. I, I think, 
you know, nothing has stopped this team from, you know, drafting a guy higher than what most people think where he should go. Uh, I I think Brazil is obviously in, 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 in still in the talk when it comes to there and uh, maybe even the Simpson kid at, at Clemson. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of names here in terms of the guys that check the boxes that's filling up here pretty quickly with just how active Tomlin and Khan have been on the pro day trail, which will continue today and probably throughout the rest of the week. So it's going to be interesting for sure. A lot of directions this, this way could go. Uh, there's no question about that. All right. All right. One uh, coaching, and this has already been you know partially talked about. Dave and I mentioned this on an earlier podcast, but Pittsburgh making official that Jason Brooks uh, has been hired. The official title is quality control coach. I think I had referenced maybe that would be his title on the Monday show. Also, the team announcing a promotion for Denzel Martin, who's officially going from uh, what assistant outside linebackers coach to just full uh, outside linebackers coach. So it's been fun to watch Martin work up through the system from scouting intern to going on the coaching side and uh, really kind of climbing the ladder. And I tweeted that out about uh, about Martin and got a couple of responses from some ex Steelers and Zach Banner, uh, who's kind of more joking, but Vince Williams uh, really singing. They, the they seem to really like him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he's, yeah, he's done so much. I mean, he's worked East West Shrine game. He was at the combine, obviously helping out with drills. And so this guy has been a really underrated figure and a cool story. Mike Tomlin met him at Missouri at a pro day. Uh, Martin was working there and Tomlin just liked the guy and hired him and, has worked up the ladder since. Yeah, and uh, I think since uh, you know you go to Instagram too, and some of these defensive players seem to be excited, you know, to, uh, uh, that that he got the promotion. So good for him. Yeah, definitely. So will will this team hire any other coaches? Do you think they're done? It's getting kind of late. Man, I think they couldn't feels, hire somebody. Yeah, it feels like it's late in the process now. I mean, here we are, almost through the pro day uh, circuit. What it got about another uh, what eight days, seven days left in the pro pro day circuit there. So never say never, but it it, it feels like they're done. I mean, is Frisman Jackson going to coach the entire receiver room by himself? I just think with some of those large numbers with offensive linemen, with receivers, you want an assistant in there. And that's what Blaine Stewart was doing. I don't think Jason Brooks will be doing that specific role. I think Brooks will help out on special teams and obviously wear hats defensively. But I would at least hire an assistant wide receivers coach to give Fris uh, Jackson some help. Uh, Speaking of Frisman, have you spotted him anywhere yet? I have not. So I think, does that say anything about maybe this team not showing a lot of interest in wide receiver? Maybe. Potentially. Because um, he was at that Georgia Pro Day last year working out Pickens, and lo and behold, Pickens became the pick. So um, I have not seen Frisman Jackson. Okay. All right, Dave, I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about. Anything else that you want to mention, feel free. Otherwise, we can get to some reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let's do that. Let's see, from Titus, uh, writes in, gentlemen, I was surprised to see the picture uh, uh, on Twitter last week that said, guess who's back and appeared to have the, have but the pre at a table and uh, have you, oh, I I don't know what he's trying to say. It seems like a typo. Gentlemen, Gentlemen, I was surprised to see the picture on Twitter last week that said, guess who's back and appeared to have, oh, I guess he, that's supposed to he says but the pre <laughs> but it's bud it's supposed to be uh uh bud or, dupree or is that a dig at, at bud dupree you call him butt dupree if you don't uh, like okay. it maybe I, I don't know uh anyway i i guess he's having have we heard anything about this I, I don't know what picture he's talking about on twitter but uh uh other than josina anderson reporting that you know, there seemed to be potential interest in him returning to the Steelers. There really hasn't been anything uh, since then. You guys got to stop using uh, vo- uh, Siri's voice uh, uh, <laughs> command to try to type your emails for you here. Yeah, I'm just kind of looking through. I see a Steelers representative at SMU's Pro Day. I, I think it's Chris Watts. I can't tell. So I'm just kind of scrolling through some of the Pro Day stuff here for any last second information. So. Steelers, somebody at SMU. I don't know who the top prospects there are this year. Uh, Ryan writes in, hey, David Knox, longtime listener, first-time writer from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. First off, best Steelers coverage in the business. He says, with the signing of Patrick Peterson, do you guys still value a cornerback of the likes of Witherspoon, 
uh, slash Gonzalez or, or Joey Porter at 17. He says, my only concern would be uh, if any of those three have any major playing experience in the slot or have they all mostly been boundary guys? Does Deontay uh, Banks from uh, Maryland have more slot experience than the other big three? He says, Peterson, more of a boundary player. It makes me think more about slot experience guys. Uh, he says, Brian Branch, although he didn't wow anyone with measurables or testing. Minka likes smarts. He says, good versatility that the Steelers look for as he could be moved around a defense. He says, in con conclusion, hopefully the Steelers can re-sign some of their special teams guys. Boykins and Sims seem most notable to me, he says, who will be returning punts and kicks without Sims. Uh, he says Austin the third or Miller. Uh, thanks and keep up the great work. Look, as far as cornerback goes, uh, uh, Witherspoon and Porter Jr. Uh, obviously mostly on, on the outside. Gonzalez did some stuff a little bit inside, didn't he? Yeah, he did some. I think you know, I think Witherspoon maybe a little bit slot as well. I think he's capable just given the frame, the run fills, the physicality, kind of being that linebacker. Although he doesn't have the size, he's got that Mike Hilton mentality. So. Uh, Gonzalez Porter, I would say traditionally are outside guys with his boot. And I think can be more inside out at the next level. Do you feel with Peterson being signed? Does that lessen, does that in any way potentially lessen, lessen an outside guy early? No, I don't think it does really at all. He's 33. He's not going to be here forever. You need some use some speed. Uh, I don't think it, I think if anything, it just kind of reinforces this team needs a young corner in there. Uh, as far as him talking about, uh, Sims and, and, you know, Boykins and Sims, we'll see, you know, I, 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 I think because of seeing James Pierre, uh, come back on that one, de one year deal on, on Tuesday there, I, I won't be surprised to see some of these, some of their own unrestricted start trickling back in through the door on lower level deals. Yeah, it's March 22nd. We got some time to figure out who's going to be doing kicks and punts. I mean, Austin, you know, Gunner's on this roster right now, but let's see how this whole roster looks. There's going to be 20 more names added to it by the time camp rolls around. So lots of time to figure that stuff out. Uh, let's see, Mark Miller. I was watching Kelly's Heroes, and it made me think of Omar Khan. He's putting together a team that believes can get the job done. They may not be the prettiest or the most decorated, but they are tough physical guys that fit the Steeler way. Uh, based on the first week of free agency, he says, I believe two things are evident. He says, you guys are right. Con and company look to be following the Colbert plan of filling team needs before the draft without breaking the bank. Uh, number two, he says, Con said at the combine, he would look to upgrade any position. If the opportunity arises, the signing of say Amalo after already signing a guard this week proves this in, is the case. He says, uh, I almost expect a similar thing. A uh, similar signing to say a at, at, at any position, regardless of of uh, of need at this point. He says I firmly believe that my that by the time the draft uh, rolls around, we'll have deals in place with Edmonds or or an upgrade, Gentry or an upgrade, bring back Bud. So basically, he's 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 trying to say that he he he's not really seeing any any difference so far with Khan and the way he does off season business as related to Colbert. By the way, I looked for Colbert at that JMU pro day, and I did, <laughs> did see you? It. Yeah. Did you see anyone there? I have not seen nah, anyone at that JMU. No, nah, I thought for sure I was going to find Colbert hanging around there. <laughs> that had been funny. Um, yeah, I guess the differences haven't been, you know, super stark, but I just think, you know, recognition that that some people thought, I thought maybe to an extent that this would be true, that it'd be more about re-signing their own and kind of a, a status quo off season, But with a first-time GM and Con and, and Weidel, they want to turn over the roster. That's pretty typical of any time a, a, a new GM takes over, even though Khan was obviously a promotion, um, you know, all that type of stuff. But yeah, I think, I, I think in terms of the pro days, I mean, Khan has been hitting the trail like Kevin Colbert did. So he's kind of got that, that same pro day. I mean, do you, who, who's been on more pro day, uh, you know, events than, than Mike Tomlin, Omar Khan, at least when it comes to head coaches and GMs. I mean, nobody right. scouts that harder than, than those guys do. Right. You're right. Uh, and look, you know, I, you could look at them not tendering the restricted free agents as, as, as potentially a sign of change or doing something different, but I mean, the market, man, you know, how, how much, and you look league wide, what did I say? It was something like 77 restricted free agents around the league did not get tendered. Uh, I, 
I don't, I don't put that in the category of the change of doing business as much as I do that the mark, market dictated them not to enter those guys. Yeah, with the tenders going up, this team having to try to navigate the cap a bit. And it's not like any of these RFAs were super, you can't lose this kind of guy. You can't bring him back on a one-year deal type. I mean, it's not anyone that's going to knock your socks off. So um, I don't think that was you know a big difference overall. All right, I think we got uh, most of these other ones out of the way here. So I just just real quick, I got to just totally random off topic. No, I, I said that the Tomlin con like nobody scouts harder than them when it comes to coaches, GMs. Nobody scouts more than the Green Bay Packers. You know how many Green Bay Packers guys I've seen trying to go back whenever you watch the like the the, the pro day videos. Just count the number of Packers scouts. There's this one Packer scout. I don't know who he is. I see him at he has to be at every pro day. They, they have to clone this guy. Like I've seen him. 20 times. I've seen this Packer scout more than I see my own family. Like this guy has been everywhere. He's always right there with the, uh, the, the, the vert and he's just always front and center. So the Packers, like they, they just go everywhere. I I still try to find out all these blurry guys that you get shots at <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out who they are and how the hell you can see the blurry Steelers on their, uh, uh on their sweatshirt or whatnot. You got to go clothing. These guys don't dress well. Like Mark Sadowski at UCLA, I was able to identify him because of his shoes, because he wore the same shoes at Northwestern oh, and UCLA. So I go I go real deep in the rabbit hole to try to detect this thing, but it works. Yeah, it does work. It does work. All right. Uh, we'll keep uh, people up to date on who all we see it uh, the rest of this week. Once again, you've got uh, Ohio State today, uh, Alabama and Wisconsin, as we mentioned on Thursday. Those will those will be worth trying to uh, uh, research out and flush out who's where when it when it when it when it comes to that stuff there. So uh, anything else to add before we get out of here? Uh, Nope, we'll be back on Friday, barring anything breaking, and talk about some pro days. All right. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to do- donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigation bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button up right navigation bar. Man, my mind's just been a little fuzzy today. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I just, uh, not enough uh, monster drinks uh, this morning. Just, Super feel like I've been in a we, cloud. We need more midnight podcasts. We're not used to the morning podcast. Well, that might be it. Days, honestly, might be it. I, I did. I I feel like uh, I uh, I was my play today was below the line. So I apologize. Oh, no, you were good. You were good. Uh, so in the meantime, until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.